In this tutorial, I, I want to give an introduction to uh, two things. So the first is the graph neural networks. The second thing is symbolic regression. Um, and then Shirley, uh, my co-advisor, is going to come after me. And her research talk is going to look at their intersection. So, um, so yeah, so this work is, is uh, from a collaboration between uh, DeepMind, Princeton, CCA. Um, I, I'm co-advised by David Spurkel and Shirley Ho. So uh, just to give you a bit of background on what I do, I, I kind of do half uh, methods development and half applied stuff. So some of the methods uh, we looked at kind of learning energies with neural networks called Lagrangian neural networks, symbolic regression and graph neural networks. That's what this talk is. Um, and then on the applied side, we do a lot of um, astrophysics and astronomy applications. So like color magnitude diagrams of normalizing flows. Um, and then we have uh, recent work on predicting instabilities in planetary dynamics. But I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to talk about um, symbolic regression and graph neural networks. So in this talk, I, I want to make uh, three main arguments. <clears throat> so if you remember nothing else from this talk, I want you to know uh, these three. So the, the first one is graph neural networks, or GNNs. Um, they're a type of architecture of neural network that allows you to work with the natural a uh, graph-like structure of the world rather than the world's projection onto grids, as is most machine learning. Um, the second thing I want to argue is that symbolic regression um, should be a first-class machine learning algorithm for the natural sciences. Um, I think it hasn't been developed that much. And I think I've only read a single paper in all of astronomy that uses symbolic regression, but it's just, it's such a powerful and interpretable technique. Um, so, so I'll explain what these are later. Um, and then the third thing is um, if you combine a graph neural network, symbolic regression, um, you get a very powerful way of learning interpretable relationships in data. So that, that's going to be in Shirley's talk. I'm going to cover one and two. So first, let's start on graph neural networks. I'm going to introduce these, motivate them, um, and give some examples. So. Uh, many, many slides are from my great collaborator, Peter Bataglia. He's at uh, DeepMind. So, uh, so I know many people on the call learn machine learning, know machine learning, but I just want to give kind of like two slide intro. So machine learning, you want to predict a vector Y given an input vector X. And this, this vector could represent, you know, a larger grid um, that you then flatten into a vector. Um, and to do this, we have uh, many examples of X and Y. And so, so this is a supervised regression problem in machine learning. Of course, there's many other types of machine learning. But this is the problem we're going to focus on today, is predicting Y given X. So the classic example of this, you uh, do a linear combination of each element of X for each element of Y. Um, and that's linear regression. So like line of best fit is the first example um, of machine learning. So deep learning, uh, you move to this, uh, I guess, the space of uh, any continuous function between uh, two vectors. So the, I think the kind of core atom of deep learning <clears throat> is this thing called a multi-layer perceptron. So it's, it's a learnable mapping. And you, you always see these diagrams with all these nodes and arrows. This is a, this is a multi-layer perceptron or MLP. These allow you to fit uh, any continuous function between two vector spaces given enough data. And I think these are, these are kind of like the atom of deep learning because you can, you can consider a lot of more modern architectures as kind of um, broken up into little MLPs um, that accomplish some subtask of the model. <clears throat> so in deep learning, if you want to learn any problem, um, you can consider it by writing down transformations and mappings between vector spaces. So uh, say we have some function that we know is composed of a dot product between this vector and maybe some learned function f. So f is some function we don't know. Um, and then we map from that dot product to another vector space, we add five 
and we pass that through another vector space. So deep learning, you can really break it down um, into these um, composable mappings between vector spaces. Um, so H, G, and F here would all be multi-layer perceptrons. And this, this structure that you, that you impose on the multi-layer perceptrons, that's kind of what separates different deep learning architectures. And in this example, you would, you would learn it um, by using the chain rule to learn the parameters of H, G, and F. So, uh, so deep learning, very popular ever since 2012 when um, Hinton's group uh, beat the ImageNet competition. So uh, deep learning is good at images, uh, language processing. It's good at uh, maybe games where you have like a pixel grid. These are things deep learning is really good at um, because there's a lot of industry investment in these types of problems. So you can think of deep, so vectors, grids, sequences, they all get VIP admission to this deep learning party. Um, but the natural world is not, it's not just vectors and grids. The natural world is uh, made up of complex structured systems. So you can think like a molecule, um, every, every atom is like a node in a graph, um, a mass spring system. You can think of uh, links in a chain and then they're like dropping on another node, um, maybe an n body system. You have three particles, two of them orbiting the other, um, maybe like a rigid body system. The, the walls bounce off these particles, maybe like a sentence you, you represent it as a parse tree, um, an image you have like pixels that interact so a lot of natural systems, um, they're, they're kind of, you have to project them onto a grid or onto a vector in order to uh, work on them with deep learning. But the natural world has this, this structure. So what we want to do is kind of work directly on that structure. Why project it to vectors and grids when we can actually work on the natural um, graph structure <coughs> of these problems. So in this example, you know, the molecule we could represent it as atoms connected by edges. Um, maybe end body system, we have three nodes connected by edges. Um, even images, you could represent it as a graph where each pixel is a node in the graph. Um, and then maybe you connect all the pixels together. So many systems in the natural world, they're just, it's so natural to represent them um, as a graph where you have nodes and then edges between nodes. <clears throat> so um, the, the standard deep learning toolkit is um, <clears throat> you start off, so the multi-layer perceptron, as I said, it's kind of like the atom of deep learning um, that works on vector spaces. So you map from one vector to another vector. Um, if your data is vectors, you have X vector, Y vector, um, you wanna go with multi-layer perceptron. If your data is um, grids, like images, um, maybe density data for a simulation, then you turn to uh, convolutional neural networks. Um, so these, you kind of, you learn a, you learn a convolutional filter um, and you pass it over your gridded data. Um, if your data is sequences, like a, like a time series or natural language, um, you move to recurrent neural network. <clears throat> so, the, the problem with all of these is there's not, there wasn't really a clear answer for uh, working on natural graph structures in the, in the world. Um, you know, all of these deep learning methods, you have to take your graph. So like maybe n body system, you project it into a gridded density field um, and then you pass it through a CNN. I mean, you're not really using the, the natural structure of the data. Um, so this is why graph neural networks were introduced. Um, so these are some key historical survey papers. Um, as I said, I work with uh, Peter Bateglia a lot. He's kind of introduced this uh, graph network formalism that tries to tie everything together. Um, so I'm going to talk about this a little bit. By the way, if there's any questions, um, please feel free to stop me or um, I don't know how I can see chat, but
but you can also you can also post a message in chat maybe um because i yeah so <clears throat> so this is how you represent a graph for a graph neural network so you can think of this system as like maybe an n-body particle system every node here is represented as a vector so vi is a node in your graph every every node in the graph has a vector with with all of the features so like a node here could represent things like the position velocity mass of the particle charge of the particle um you know if it's like if this node represents a group of object it could represent the sum of their mass or something um the next thing in the graph is is these edges so e so this represents a connection or a relationship between two objects so in going back to the example of like n body systems this edge could represent um, the gravitational constant or other coupling constants so it, it kind of gives you a parameter to describe um, the relation between two objects now of course if all of your nodes are like maybe the same class of particle um, you you don't really need to have these edges so like if it's an n body system everything is described by gravity you don't really need to have like gravitational constant in each edge. Um, you could just say there's an edge between these particles um, and not an edge between these particles. Um, so like a one or a zero there. Um, the last thing is a global quantity. <clears throat> so this describes um, some maybe summary statistic of the graph or some, some just global quantity. So once you represent your data set in this format, um, there's a there's a massive kind of corpus of all these different graph neural network techniques that you can apply um, to your data set. So this is how you represent a graph network in uh, the completely generalized case. <clears throat> so you have this graph that goes in and another graph that comes out. So you can see here V, E, U, that comes out V prime, E prime, U prime. So, <clears throat> The way this works is there's three steps. And on, on the next slide, I'll, I'll describe more of what these mean. So you, you start off with a global quantity, a set of nodes, and another set of edges. You pass all of these to um, some function, phi e. It could be like a multi-layer perceptron. Um, and then this calculates the new edges. Um, it passes the new edges to some uh, so these row operators here, there's some permutation invariant operator. So rho could be like a summation. It could be a maximum, a minimum, uh, an average. These, the only thing they have to be is a permutation invariant operator. So maybe this could calculate the average of all the edges and it passes it to this function, which then calculates the updated nodes um, and then yeah, so, so let me just describe these more on the next slide. Can I ask yeah. a quick question? Um, yep. The capital V and capital E that are going in are lists of numbers that live on the vertices and numbers that live on the edges. Is that right? They're not yeah. in the, because often you'll see V to mean the set of vertices. It, it, it's, yeah, so, it's so actually a set of, the set of vertices. It's a function that lives on the vertices, and E is another function that lives on the edge. No, no, no. Uh, these are numbers. So V is a set of vectors. Every vector is uh, describes one node. So like V is a set of uh, particle states summarized as vectors, and every every vector contains like mass, position, velocity of that particle. That's V, and then okay. E. So it's a cool. set. Right, so it's a multi, it's a function in, in math, you'd say it's, it's a map from the set of vertices to R to the D. D is the number of different types of object on, on each vertex, right? Mass, whatever. Uh, so I yeah. just wanna get- I think that sounds correct, yeah. It's a, like a vector valued function that lives on the vertices and E is another vector valued function that lives on the edges, is that? Yes, but so, E also describes um, the existence of edges. So 
the vectors in E, they would also hold like the indices between nodes. So you can see here that there, there's an edge to this node, but there's not an edge back. So in this case, we could say, maybe this is node one, this is node two. So we could say one edge is like one comma two, and then there's just nothing for the opposite direction. Um, so it would be like one comma two comma, and then all the edge properties. Okay, so it's not only edge weights, but the, there's another vector that lives on the edges too. Yep. Okay, thanks. So describe, it just describes the connection. Um, yeah. Uh, and then the global is just a single vector. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, awesome. So let's discuss the details of this operation. So I said there's, there's three blocks, an edge block, node block, global block. So edge updates the edges, node updates the nodes, global updates the global. So the edge block is some function of every, so it, it's, a, it's a function of the, the current edge you're considering, comma, the receiving node, comma, the sending node, comma, the global. So this is some function of all those vectors concatenated. So we usually represent phi E as a multi-layer perceptron. So this would be a, a neural network from the current edge state to the updated edge state. Does that, okay, let, let me know if you have any questions. So the next function is, uh, this is the node block. So I said there's this thing called the row, um, which is a permutation invariant operation. So in this example, um, if we calculate uh, E prime, then the, the row E to V might be like a summation. So this E uh, bar, that might be the average uh, edge connected to that node. So we could, we could sum all the connected edges um, into E bar, basically. So the node block will take the, the pooled edge, the current node state, and the global value, and map it to the updated node state. <clears throat> so that's the function of the node state, of the node block. It takes this uh, pooled edge, all the connecting edges, the current node state, the current global value, and it maps to the updated node state. And again, this, uh, we usually just treat this as a multi-layer perceptron, so a neural network. So the last thing is called the global block. <clears throat> so we take the pooled edges and we basically pool it over all edges in the graph. So we take this edge, this edge, this edge, this edge, just every edge and we pool it. So some permutation invariant operation, like, like maybe you're just taking the average edge. You take the average edge value um, over all edges in your graph and then you take the average node value or maybe the max node value. So this is another permutation invariant um, operate, or sorry, this one, permutation invariant operation um, that calculates maybe the average node state. Then- so Is it true that you're not changing the shape of the graph at any time? You're not adding edges, adding nodes, merging edges, merging nodes? So in, in this example, um, you're not. So a graph network maps um, basically to the same structure. Um, and there are other types of models that can um, kind of uh, generate edges and generate nodes um, or delete edges, delete nodes. Um, but in this example, you're, you're mapping to the same structure. And so, so one other thing you could do if you wanna remove edges, add edges is you could have a fully connected graph and then maybe some value on the edge represents like a continuous probability of connection or something. And then you could update it that way. Um, so, so in this example, we're updating the global value of the graph. So maybe we're calculating the new temperature of some end body system. So in this example, we take the pooled edge vectors 
the pooled node states in the current global value and map it to an updated global value. So again, this is, for us, this is always a multi-layer perceptron. So it's a neural network between, uh, as a function of the pooled edges, the pooled nodes in the current global. So maybe it's calculating like a new uh, background magnetic field, temperature, energy, um, some global property of that graph. So those are the, the three functions um, for a graph neural network. And you can basically take this, uh, you can take this and basically um, use it like a RNN. So you basically copy paste it, copy paste it, and you can do multiple um, graph updates and kind of, um, you can either do that or just do a single step. Um, but this is a way of mapping from graph to graph and you can, you can kind of chain them any way you like. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, so inside, so basically you're, you're, in terms of representation, you can represent the graph that, you, that you've described. Once you have the initial graph, you basically, you can represent it as a single big long vector, right? Because you're not changing, you're not moving things around, you're not changing the length, you're not doing anything like that, right? Uh, okay, so um, yes, but no. So the fact that these are permutation invariant means that you can use the same functions in the graph network on different size graphs. So I can have a particle system with five particles. I can train my model and then I can apply the same graph network to a 10 body system without changing a thing in the graph network. That's the huge advantage of the graph neural network is there uh, invariant to the, the size of the input graph. I mean, it'll, so this example, it'll give you the same output size, but um, the input size doesn't matter basically. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, somewhat, thank you. So this is, uh, so again, as I said, uh, so Peter particular kind of unified all these different approaches to graph neural networks um, under this one graph to graph approach. And um, you, can, you can kind of get back the other models. So you might've heard of things called the deep sets, message passing neural networks, um, transformers are recently very popular, um, relation networks. You can, you can get to these models by basically uh, just removing operations. So like a deep set, you pass it a set and a, a maybe like some conditional feature and you calculate a global value for the set. So this is, you can represent this as a graph network with just um, the node block. So it's calculating some updated node state and then it pools those updated node states um, and it passes it to a global block, which then uh, calculates. And this, this could be like a different size vector, for instance. Um, so maybe in this example, you have a bunch of particles, you pass it to there, uh, you take an average or a sum or a max, and then you calculate maybe the energy of the system or something. Um, so uh, yeah, and then, so this is like a transformer model. You start with a set and you output another set. Um, you can represent this as a graph network. Um, and I think this would be your attention. I think this would be your attention model in row. If, if you're, if anybody's familiar with transformers. Um, so yeah, so this, this graph network is a, it's a way of mapping from any graph, even a graph without an edge, uh, without edge features, um, without a global, without the nodes themselves um, to another graph. Um, and you can, you can kind of get back all these different transforms. Um, and again, the main advantage of this is you work with the natural structure of data. You work with uh, edges, nodes, and you can, you can apply the same model to a different size system. So you train it on five bodies, you apply to 10 bodies. I mean, it might not generalize, and that's actually what Shirley's gonna talk about, our work on that. Um, but it's not a multi-layer perceptron where you have to put in the same size vector every single time. Um, it's a fundamentally different type of architecture. So in this example, we can represent physical systems as graphs. So like n-body, 
uh, the particles would be nodes, the edges would be like the gravitational constant, um, maybe balls. So one of the nodes you would actually represent it as the wall um, and maybe, uh, yeah, maybe, and then you could simulate it and, and uh, it would learn to kind of deflect the balls back into the system. And in this example, it's a string and you have nodes describing each link in the string um, and another node for the particle holding it up. So you would, you would uh, maybe you would use like a one hot encoding to describe different types of nodes in these systems. Um, and then it would learn their interaction. So in this example, we can actually see it. So these are the, these are the true systems. And then we're gonna learn these systems. So you can see it, it does very well at learning physical systems, um, just, uh, just using this graph neural network. And the really nice thing about this is you get zero shot generalization to systems with larger n. <clears throat> so because of the way the graph neural network is structured with these pooling operations, um, you don't really care how large uh, the system is that you're applying it to. I mean, it might not train again, or it might not uh, generalize perfectly, um, but the architecture itself <clears throat> is invariant to uh, n in this case. So this is from our paper that Shirley's gonna talk about, but you can make an analogy to Newtonian mechanics. So in this example, every particle is a, is a node. So you have three nodes in your system um, and say there's an edge between every particle in both directions. So here we don't actually consider an edge attribute because they all have the same constant. Um, but we basically start off with we consider all the pairs of particles. So in the graph network term, this is every pair of nodes. In Newtonian mechanics terms, this is two interacting particles. You consider every receiving particle and sending particle. Back in the graph network, you pass it through an edge model. So each pair goes through the edge model separately. These are, these are each vectors. Each of these balls is a vector. Um, and so Newtonian mechanics, that's like calculating the force between two particles. You then get these, uh, these messages and you pool them. So in this example, it's a sum pool. You're just element-wise summing the vectors. Newtonian mechanics, that's like calculating the net force between particles. Um, so really in this example, the message is kind of like a high dimensional generalization of a force vector. It's a, it's a learned high dimensional force vector in this example. Um, then you concatenate it with the original node state and you pass it through a second function, which is another neural network. And this is kind of like F equals MA. So you calculate the acceleration given the mass in this pooled force. Um, and then you calculate the updated node state or for Newtonian mechanics, you would calculate um, the next velocity of the particle. Okay, so that was my first argument is a graph neural network is a, it's a it describes the natural uh, graph like structure of data rather than having to project it to a vector or an image. Um, you can just work with that graph structure. The All right, can I ask a question? Yep. Um, if you do this kind of time, prop uh, time propagation with a GNN, what do you use as a cost function? Uh, it, it really depends on the problem. Hmm? It, it really depends on the problem. Like if you're trying to predict the acceleration of particles, you yeah. could train on the acceleration or you could use it like a neural ODE and uh, iterate it several times and try to predict the next state. Okay. So, so in that example, you could either train on the raw positions of particles as a function of time or train on their accelerations, which is, I guess it's kind of like unsupervised, supervised. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, Thanks. Yeah. So the, the next thing I, I want to talk about, um, and so, so let me know if you have any questions about graph neural networks, because I'm, I'm going to sh shift gears here. Um, so yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Okay, so this is part two of my talk. I'm going to talk about 
symbolic regression, and we're going to conclude with an example. So symbolic regression is a machine learning algorithm. So again, you fit uh, y given x, but the difference from most machine learning is that the basis that you're, you're exploring is that of analytic equations. So symbolic regression, you actually search the space of analytic equations. So um, if you have like some data set y and x, you would search for f inside the set of all analytic equations. So you try to fit y as a function of f, um, and f is an analytic equation. So if you see this function, um, you might guess, OK, maybe it's like, uh, it looks exponential, so maybe exponential. And then you evaluate your loss and see that you're almost there. So you say, OK, maybe exponential where the argument is divided by 2. Yes, so that, that fits the data perfectly. So this is, this is the spirit of symbolic regression, is you search the space of analytic functions. So you could say, is it cosine, sine, no, no. Um, exponential, almost. Exponential over 2, yes. So that, that is uh, manual symbolic regression, I guess. So, so, so why, why do we want to do this? So if you look up on Google just like physics 101 cheat sheet, what you get is this equation sheet. Um, and everything on it for your intro to physics is just basic analytic equations. So all of this classical mechanics physics is just uh, almost perfectly described by analytic equations. So the question is, OK, so if we know that this is such a good basis for so much of physics, chemistry, uh, mechanics, why don't we use that basis for our machine learning model? If all of our physical theories are described in this language, why don't we actually use that language um, for a model? There's, there's no physical theory written in terms of the weights of a neural network. Um, so this is, this is kind of like the motivation for symbolic regression. <clears throat> Um, so I see David Spurgles on the call. So he, he, he made the connection to this amazing article by Eugene Wigner um, on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. So I'll just read this quote. So the, the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift, which we neither understand nor deserve. We should be grateful for it and hope that it will remain valid in future research and that it will extend for better or for worse to our pleasure, even though perhaps also to our bafflement to wide branches of learning. So he, in this article, he makes all these connections between seemingly unrelated sciences um, that actually have the same mathematical principles um, underlying them. So, uh, so yeah, so David suggested we call this a uh, Wignerian prior. So a Wignerian prior <coughs> is a, prior on your machine learning model such that you favor simple analytic expressions. So we know that this already works for like mechanics, physics, chemistry, um, because so much of that field is described in terms of these equations. Um, maybe, maybe not other fields, or maybe we just haven't discovered them yet, <clears throat> or they're too complex or something, um, but definitely uh, physics and astrophysics, we know it's a good prior. So, okay, so you may be asking, okay, but still, why should we use this prior? So the first is it's very concise. If you write down an analytic equation, it's very concise. It's interpretable. Um, you can understand the scaling just by glancing at it, whereas a neural network, it's very hard to do that. Um, you can detect potential uh, failures of your model ahead of time. You could see that there's a singularity in your equation at some given point in parameter space. Um, and then the last thing, which, which might be a much deeper problem, um, so Shirley's going to talk about this a bit, is that <clears throat> we observed analytic equations may generalize better to out of distribution data than neural networks um, for, for physical problems. So recall that a neural network, if you have ReLU activation functions, um, the best it can do is extrapolate uh, linearly. But analytic equations, 
um, it seems that they can potentially generalize much better. Um, so Shirley's going to talk about that more. So how does it work? So <clears throat> you work on the space of um, uh, trees. So this is like a, a binary tree also with unary operators. So like if we want to do x1 times x4 plus the cosine of x2 minus this constant, uh, we could represent it as this tree. So this is, this is uh, the data structure that symbolic regression works on. So we actually use genetic algorithms to search this space. So we could have, we could choose any of these random mutations for this tree. So like maybe we could switch this multiplication with a division. Uh, we could switch this variable with another variable, uh, maybe delete this tree, this subtree and, and switch the cosine with an X2 or maybe take a constant and change it a little bit. Um, so these are, these are all random mutations that are considered in uh, symbolic regression. And you, you kind of randomly apply them and, and see basically just what works best. So um, regularized evolution is this, uh, it's this more recent approach to genetic algorithms that works pretty well. So you take the, uh, so you have this large population, you take a small random sample of that population, maybe like 10 equations. You take the fittest equation, so the, the best loss equation, uh, you, you take it out, you apply some random mutation to it, and then you get the oldest equation, the one that's been in your population the longest, you, you, you basically kill it and you replace it with your mutated sample. So it's, uh, it's kind of like natural selection applied to equations. Um, and you would basically repeat this process again and again. Um, and this, this uh, searches the space of equations um, in, an, in an almost efficient way. So, uh, so I wrote this package called uh, PICER, and that's what I'll be giving the demo in later. Um, it's, a, it's written in Python front end in a Julia back end. Um, and it's a simple implementation of regularized evolution with some other optimization algorithms. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty fast and it's parallelizable. So um, I created this after using, so Eureka is the classic example of this kind of software. Uh, so there's a Schmidt and Lipson paper in 2009. So this, this algorithm is proprietary, costs a lot of money, it's GUI only. You can't really customize it. Um, I think I tried maybe 10 other open source packages. I found many of them just be, be slow um, overcomplicated, you can't really customize them, and they're all kind of sequential. So, so PICER is is uh, kind of evolved from my uh, frustration. So I, I finally gave up and just wrote my own. So, so PICER is parallelizable over hundreds of cores. Um, I've I've used it on uh, on Rusty before, um, and it implements regularized evolution on equations, and it also implements some new algorithms that I found helped a lot. So simulated annealing, um, rather than just mutate and put an equation back, you actually calculate a probability of acceptance, kind of like a Metropolis Hastings, um, with uh, some temperature that you turn down over time. And, and I find this procedure helps a lot. Um, I also have a Nelder Mead um, optimizer for the constants. So it's not just mutating constants, it actually optimizes them, um, which works a lot. Uh, and then I have this kind of like, I have, I have new features like adaptive parsimony, um, which is the punishment for complex equations. Um, and then I have this other new feature to uh, apply operator specific constraints. So in this example, uh, I allow simple power laws with the exponent, um, but uh, sorry, the exponent, but I, I don't allow like a complex exponent. Um, so I, I find constraints like this really help a lot at getting more interpretable equations. <clears throat> and I also allow custom operators. So I'll walk you through this. Um, so just after concluding this, so I talked about graph neural networks. Um, please email me or, uh, or anything if you have other questions about graph neural networks and, and maybe applying it to your problem. Then I talked about symbolic regression. And I, I, I really think this should be uh, 
it should be used a lot more than it is for the natural sciences because it's interpretable, concise, and it generalizes well. Um, and so Shirley's gonna talk about their combination, which we used in recent work to discover this new uh, effective law for dark matter um, from simulations. Um, so yeah, so I just thought I'd give a demo of PICER um, to show you how it works and how you can use symbolic regression. So if everybody could go to this link, um, or if someone could may maybe uh, enter it in chat, I don't actually know how to see chat. Uh, here, let me just stop the share and I'm gonna switch to my browser. Okay, awesome, someone wrote it. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna share my screen too and we can go through it. Okay. Share screen. Okay. So I thought it would be useful just to walk through some simple symbolic regression examples just to introduce you to it. So this is a Google Colab notebook. If you haven't used it before, it's like Google Docs for Jupyter Notebook. Um, the really nice thing is they also give you free GPU time um, to kind of tinker around with deep learning. So uh, so let's just walk through this notebook together. The first thing you want to do is um, you, could, you could save a copy in your Google Drive um, so you can, you can play around with this later. Um, or you could just download it to your desktop. Um, so the next thing we want to do is turn on the GPU. Um, we're going we're gonna to use the GPU later. So you, you go to the notebook settings and, and pick the GPU can also get a TPU, but I haven't played around with it yet. I can't see uh, anybody's faces. So just let me know if you can't uh, get started or something. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is just install Julia. So I, as I said, Pyser uses Julia um, as the high performance backend and Pyser as the front end. So this just installs Julia um, in Google Colab. So let's just run this really quick. Um, and if this goes well, it should print out success. Yeah, so, um, so uh, yeah, I'm kind of curious to see how many of you have actually used Julia before. Um, I, I feel like Julia is, is uh, it has a reputation as a answer to Python, but I, I think this is kind of the wrong way of looking at it. I feel like, like Python is the slow glue language that you use to stick things together. Um, and Julia has similar syntax to Python, but it's kind of like a replacement for um, C++, because um, it, it gives you that level of performance. Kyle, uh, Miles, it does beg yeah. the question, why not just do it all in Julia? <laughs> why yeah, so the reason is because uh, I, I use a lot of other machine learning um, algorithms um, and I, I kind of want to link them together with symbolic regression and so much of machine learning is just done in Python. Like all the, so Julia has flux.jl. Um, I haven't looked around with it, but there's just so much, um, Whenever someone writes a new deep learning paper, it's always Python implementation. So yeah, so that's why I have the front end. Um, eventually I'm gonna have a, a pure Julia package that this one kind of interfaces, but then you can just do pure Julia if you want. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I really like, uh, I like Julia a lot. Okay, so, so this is just installing some, some packages like uh, an optimizer package and then special functions. Okay. Okay, so success. And then we're gonna install, so this is uh, my package, Pyser. We're gonna install PyTorch Lightning, which is, uh, it's just a, it basically turns PyTorch into Keras. So it's, it's really easy to train models. Okay, so let's just do the imports. So 
for the first example, let's learn some simple function. So, so this constant times cosine of x3 plus x0 squared minus two. So let's generate maybe 100 data points, uh, five features each, and then we'll just write out our function. So this is the Pyser call syntax. So you pass in your, um, your NumPy array as a 100 rows, um, five features each. You can also pass in a pandas array if you want, pandas data frame, um, and then your, uh, your desired output. So in this case, it has to be, it can only fit um, one dimension as output right now. Um, so this has to be a 1D array. Um, this is where you define your operators. So we're saying, okay, you're allowed to use, uh, you're allowed to add things, multiply things together, take cosines, exponents, sine. Um, those are the binary operators, unitary, unitary operators, and this is how many, this is basically the training time. So let's, let's run that. So the way it works in the backend is the Python is used to um, kind of meta program the Julia so it's more efficient. Um, and then, uh, then they basically decouple completely. So the, the Python just calls a shell command to run Julia, um, which, so I think Julia has its own like pi Julia thing. So you can, you can kind of interface Julia uh, more easily, but I, I found it slowed down the multiprocessing a lot. So the, the Python is just basically calling this Julia function. Um, it's just launching Julia. So um, by default, it runs on four cores. Um, so that's what this is. So once it, so I think the first time it runs, it has to, like Julia does all this pre-compilation of libraries. So it's probably um, compiling the optimizer or stuff like that. Um, yeah, so we, so we can just let that run in the background because I have the output. So the output of this call um, is a pandas data frame. And in this data frame, you have uh, your equations sorted by complexity. So this, so complexity here just means um, the number of operators, constants, and variables. Um, and so that lets you basically sort by uh, complexity and error. So you can kind of apply um, Occam's razor and choose the simplest equation that gives you some threshold of loss. Um, Okay, so, so it's starting to run. So you see, it already found this equation. Um, so, so we didn't have to run it that long. Um, you can see that it, it just prints during training. So you can see it found the correct equation, which is a cosine multiplied by the constant plus x zero squared. So we, we can just stop it, it already found it. Okay, so now we can uh, print this and it gives, um, yeah, so it, gives all the equations. Um, so let's just discuss the different columns. So as I said, complexity describes the complexity of the equation. There's mean squared error of how well it approximates the data. Um, the score column is something we, uh, we describe in our paper. And it, it basically looks for drop-offs in the error versus complexity curve. And so when you see a cliff, in the error versus complexity curve, that uh, that frequently indicates that you found the correct equation, <clears throat> um, and that's a result that was found in the original Schmidt and Lipson paper. So um, that's what the score column is. Then there's the equation, which is just um, the Pyser representation, and then you can get the SymPy format, which is a it's a prettier way of printing equations. And then you can also call the lambda format, which gives you um, a callable function. So you can actually call the equation without having to write it out by hand. Um, so we, we can just print this and we can see that, okay, it found the correct equation. So x zero squared plus two uh, cosine x three. So the next thing I wanna talk about is custom operators. So this is my, one of my biggest gripes with Eureka. You can't define custom operators. This is really easy in Pyser. Um, so say we have this equation that we want to learn and say we know it's like x zero to the power of four minus two. 
So we generate this data. In Picer, you can define a custom operator by just writing it out. So you have these binary operators here. You define cosine, x, sine, those are already written. And then we can define a new operator, the quartic power, by just writing quart of x equals x to the power of four. So this is Julia syntax, and that's why it's power like that. Um, and that just, uh, the Python will just spit out Julia code um, to basically run this within the symbolic regression. So that's how you define an operator and you can just run it. Um, so that's really nice if you are tackling some problem and you know that some operator is very important, um, you can just define it here um, and it will use that during the symbolic regression search. Um, any questions? So the X can be a multidimensional array, right? So this X is, uh, it only works on scalar input. No, no, I understand, but I'm saying the first X, the first X uh, in the in the Pyser function, that, oh, yeah. this that is can be multidimensional. So I can I can plug in here like uh, a like different vectors of yeah. different parameters, and then I have my Y, which is one vector that is the observation I'm trying to fit to. Exactly. Yep. That's yeah. So so we can see like X. Well, it's running now, but I think X is a NumPy array, 100 rows, five columns. Um, so every column is a different feature. Um, so when you define a, an operator, it has to be on a single scalar. But the nice thing about Julia is it automatically vectorizes it for you. Okay, so we, we can see I already found it. So the chord of X zero to the fourth minus two. So let's stop it. Um, and so this just prints out the best equation. Yeah. So so we already found it using our custom operator. So are you uh, using a trained model here? Is, the, is this yeah. against something that's been trained yeah. or? It's just brute force genetic algorithms. Yeah, not even the hyperparameters have been tuned. Um, so, so my initial reaction was, why not just try all of them? But then I realized that you have that you have the constants problem. So I, how, how is the constant space searched? Okay. so. The, there's one mutation that basically perturbs a constant. It either multiplies it by like a value from one to two, a random value, or it divides it by a random value from one to two, or it randomly multiplies it by negative one. Um, that is a mutation that is going on in this algorithm. Um, so that's how it searched constant space. And then after every iteration of maybe like a hundred, um, mutations, it does a Nelder, uh, a Nelder meat optimization run. And then it actually tunes the constant. So that's how it can get this constant so accurately, if that was your question. Yes, that was. Thank you. Yeah, so, so nothing is tuned or trained. It's just, uh, it's just really fast genetic algorithms. Um, I think it would be cool to have something that like can embed the weights or embed the equations in like a neural network, but I haven't done that. Um, so so how, how do you initialize the, the uh, constant after you do an operator substitution? So Sorry? if I change multiplication to exponentiation and I'm and my constant was three, well, three times something is not so big, but exp of, you know, three times something is, yeah. uh, it, you know, is much bigger, you know? Yeah, what's the question? Well, how do you initialize it? You know, if you, if you do mutation to a new uh, operator in your tree, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. Then all of a sudden, you know, you, the numbers that it coughs out are gonna be just nowhere near right because, yeah. the, you know, you don't know where the initial constants are to bring it into that. Definitely. So is there an initial fit every time you do an operator mutation or something? Oh, no. It's just the, the randomness of it just allows you to search that space. I mean, if you were always doing, like only choose the, the best equation um, and mutate that one, it would be hard to find it. But because you're doing this, this subsampling, you mutate within the sample, um, then you find a different subsample. That randomness just lets you explore the space efficiently. Yeah, so, I mean, the initial equations that you initialize, they will be, they will be far off from your final equation. 
There's a couple of questions on uh, the chat. One is whether it can work with complex functions, and the other is whether you prioritize certain fu uh, functions over others. Uh, or okay. cool. them all. So, so complex numbers, no, but I feel like you could just do search and replace inside the Julia code with the, like I think Julia has complex numbers by default. It does. Um, and I think that that might just do it, but um, I haven't tried. And then the second question, no. So everything's uniform random probability. There's no, there's no uh, functions prioritized. It's just a uh, brute force, like genetic, al well, not brute force, it's genetic algorithm, but uniform probabilities. Um, okay, so I don't, I think I finished it too, right? So I don't have that much time. So if you wanna do noise, I have an example for noise here. Um, you can just assign weights. And then this is the last thing I wanna talk about. So this is a high dimensional data set. So let's say that you have a time series and you wanna learn some equation over the entire time series. So this is like 500 dimension input and you wanna predict some number. So how do, you, how do you do that in symbolic regression? So pure symbolic regression is, is pretty much impossible. So you have to consider maybe like 10 to the nine equations uh, for your like um, the thing. So you, this is the time series problem, the true equation. We have yi is the summary statistic for any given time. Um, it's set x zero squared plus six cosine two times x, x two. We sum this over the time series um, and then we square it at the output. So that is how Z is defined with respect to this time series. And there's a hundred time steps. So if we wanted to fit an equation for G, like the thing we're summing and fit an equation for F, the thing that takes the sum and manipulates it, we'd have to search the square of the number of equations, 10 to the 18 equations. Um, but the trick is that we found in our paper is that you should first do this with the neural network. So the neural network basically learns F and G simultaneously. And then you rip out those parts of the neural network and you approximate them each with symbolic regression. And then you only have to consider two times 10 to the nine equations. Um, so yeah, so I'll just run through this. So like, you, you fit, so this example fits G and F with a neural network. Uh, and then we, we fit the neural network and fit G. Oh yeah, so, so we take the trained neural network, which has learned some function that it's summing over a time series. And we fit that using symbolic regression. And we actually recover the, uh, the same equation that went into the time series. So, just to emphasize, this is like a 500 dimensional problem and we're getting an equation out of it, like an analytic expression that describes um, the output if we assume this inductive bias. So yeah, so, uh, so it looks like it's over too. So you can go through this on your own time.